Let's start with three scriptures this morning. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Ephesians 3, and Daniel chapter 7. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we want to read verse 23. Then Ephesians 3, we'll read from verses 14 through 21. And then Daniel chapter 7, verses 24 through 26. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, let's go ahead and read verse 22 along with it. Abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Now, W-H-O-L-L-Y, not H-O-L-Y, but W-H-O-L-L-Y. Holy. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then Ephesians 3, from verse 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. And then Daniel chapter 7, verses 24 through 26. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall rise, and another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until the time and times and the dividing of times." Now, I want to remind us this morning of some words that we've been speaking for the last close to three years, and that is that we'll have to be in a position where we will allow God to help us to change our thinking, and that there are things that would appear to be a particular way, and they are not. I want to keep that before you and keep that in your thinking because it's going to be so important as time goes on. There are lots of things that look like they're one way, and I think we're finding that out already, that they're not the way that they look like, and we'll have to be in a position where we're going to be willing to change the way we think a lot about a lot of things. Now, this morning, if we want a title, we'll call it the Synergy of Strength. One of the things that the scriptures teach us is that there would be a concentrated move of Satan in the latter times to attempt to wear out the saints. And um, of course, if you're a saint, a real believer in these times, and you've been around for a while, doesn't matter whether you're young, old, in between, you will have experienced an uh, attempt to just wear you out uh, mentally, physically. I mean, all kinds of things going on with, and, 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 and if you're not aware of that, you have to be aware of it. One of the ways that we win is by being aware of what's going on. Knowledge is really power, especially when we put it to use. But if you know what's going on and you know what to expect, you know what your enemy's doing, you, you can be prepared to deal with that, all right? And so being sober-minded about what's going on in these latter times is important to us. We have to know that the enemy is going to be attempting to wear out the saints. Now, you don't have to be worn out and overcome. Amen. Yeah, amen. Okay. Uh, you, you don't have to be worn out and overcome, all right? And I'm not going to be worn out and overcome, okay? We don't have to be. That doesn't have to happen, all right? But now, there will be 
things going on that will attempt to make that happen. One of the ways is just plain old pressure. Now, I want to look at a scripture in in 1 Peter chapter 5, because there's pressure that comes from all different angles. Many times people think that the only pressure that there is is some kind of a solicitation to sin. But there's pressure that comes in more than areas than just of a solicitation to sin. This pressure comes from other people. This pressure comes from circumstances around you. There's all kinds of pressure that can arise. There's mental pressure. There's lots of that going on, a lot of mental pressure. But look at what Peter said here. First Peter chapter 5 from verse 6, he said, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting a few of your cares upon him. Excuse me? What happened? Oh, my, my bad. Okay, all. Casting all your cares or all your anxieties upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. He wants to do that for us. He doesn't want us being anxious and worried. He wants to handle that himself. I did think I heard heard an amen on that. Yeah. (laughs) Then he said, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. So he's seeking. Obviously, he cannot devour everybody. He's seeking whom he may devour. So that means you don't have to sign up. I don't have to sign up to be devoured. Amen. All right. He said, whom resist? Steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. And he's saying, in other words, right there, you're not the only one going through stuff. (laughs) Sometimes people can think that I'm the only one dealing with this. It ain't fair. Nobody else dealing with this but me. Well, here the Bible kind of straightens out our thinking here because Peter told these guys, he said, hey, y'all, everybody's dealing with stuff. Amen. All right. So don't get isolated in your thinking and get out there thinking, oh, I'm the only one going through this. And poor me. No. See, the enemy wants to get people isolated and by themselves. You get you isolated. He can whoop up on you. But if you stay connected, you'll be all right. That might be for some of you who are watching online. He said, whom resists the steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world, but the God of all grace, who has called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After that you've suffered a while, he'll make you perfect. Establish and notice, strengthen and settle you. Look at those words. Establish, strengthen, and settle Those are good words. Establish, strengthen, and settle. Now, if you notice, a part of him being able to do that goes back up to verses 6 and 7 with us humbling ourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt us in due time. And we do that by casting all of our cares and anxieties over on him. I remember somewhere Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, I believe it was, he said, there's no way that any of you can make one black hair gray or white. He said, you you can't change it. So what good does it do to be worried or anxious about anything going on in your life? Anxiety never changes anything. So he says, Humble yourselves under my mighty hand that I may exalt you in due time. Just throw all your anxiety over on me and let me be anxious for you. Literally literally is what he's saying. Let me be anxious for you. So you might want to look at your neighbor. You might want to pull out your mirror or whatever or whatever you want to do and just say this. Listen. Don't be anxious. Worried or fretful about anything. If you feel like you want to be that way, throw it on the Lord and be wise. Leave it there. Don't take it back from it. Hallelujah. Okay. Now, another way that, and this is a big one here. Matter of fact, we've been talking about this for years, years before all this stuff started around here. But one of the ways that the enemy would use 
to try to wear us out is through what's called iniquity or lawlessness. Now, some of you may remember Matthew 24, 12. Jesus said that because iniquity or lawlessness would abound, that the love of many would grow cold. He was talking about things that would go on in the latter times in Matthew 24. And one of the things he said there is that because lawlessness would be in such abundance that many people would just say, I'm not going to love anymore. Forget it. There's too much lawlessness going on. There are too many people getting away with stuff they're not supposed to be getting away with. And, you know, I'm trying to live and walk holy and righteous, but it looks like the more I try, you know, I take two or three steps forward, and I'm looking at all these people around me, look like they're getting blessed, look like they're prospering, all these kind of crazy things, and here I am, I'm like, I feel like I'm trying to push a tank. We see people doing stuff that they should be arrested, maybe some of them should even be arrested for treason, hung, shot, and it doesn't look like anything's going on. So you think, you know, what am I bothering to try to, to do right for? Because none of y'all in here ever had that kind of thought, I'm sure. All right? All right, but see, he said the Bible, the Bible says that that's one of the things that would happen in the latter times, and it, because people would focus on it, it would cause their love to grow cold. Okay, now, check this other scripture out, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This is really interesting. This is a doozy. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 from verse 1. If we don't think the Holy Spirit knows and knew the future, man, he had another thought coming. He had a guy write something over 2,000 years ago that is applicable to us right now. He said, now we beseech you from verse 1, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together to him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. Wow. So there are going to be a lot of different things coming out that are going to try to deceive. He said, don't let any man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember you not that when I was with, was yet with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withholds that he may be revealed in his time. Now look at this, this. For the mystery of iniquity is already at work. Only he who now lets will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now notice he said even at that time he was talking to them, he said this mystery of lawlessness is already working. And so we know that the way spiritual things progress towards an apex, that if that lawlessness was at work, then from what we also know from the scriptures, it was going to be gradually on the increase in the same way that righteousness from God is going to be on the increase. Because there is coming a time when the ultimate of good and evil are going to hit head to head. There's going to be a direct meeting between the Lord Jesus Christ and the Antichrist. It's going to happen. And so everything in time has been progressing towards that. And so he said this mystery of lawlessness, it's working. Now, I like the way that the Amplified Bible puts this seventh verse. He said, for the mystery of lawlessness, that hidden principle of rebellion against constituted authority. Really interesting. Now, you know, I, I've been being, working on being patriotic for, patriotic for a long time. I've been talking about things going on in the land for a long time. But this, this thing here lets us know something really important about our time. Rebellion against constituted authority or lawful authority. When you think about it, and if we think about it like we should, if we looked at all the nations of the earth, we would come to the conclusion that there is no nation that ever had anything like America has. Especially where a constitution, a bill of rights is concerned. 
Think about it. Why is it there is such a problem right now for people who want to do this nation harm to be able to do it in full measure? People have been trying to take this thing down almost since the beginning and hadn't been able to get it done. Why? Because there are people on this land that do know what has been written before time that can be stood on. There are nations right now all over this earth that are being overrun and taken over just like that because the governments on them are tyrannical or the people don't have any, the people always have God-given rights, but there are nations where governments don't respect and understand it because there is not anything written for that to be done with. Y are you with me? All right. So now, now let's think about it. Rebellion against constituted authority. If we look at things going on on our land right now, what do we see? Okay, I have a copy of the Bill of Rights right here. And I'm, I'm going to read something. I want you to, to think about it and just answer me and, and see whether or not this is what's going on right now. All right, can you do that? All right, here's Amendment 1. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Do you see a violation of that on our land? The, 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 excuse me? It's there, isn't it? Okay, but now this is, this is constituted authority. So it means that whoever is coming against that is coming against constituted authority. Duh. <laughs> Take the second one. A well, amendment to a well regulated militia, militia, excuse me, being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. <laughs> The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. What do you see going on? Are there people out there trying to get people guns? Is that right or wrong? Am I, am I just, am I talking off the wall? No, I'm not. <laughs> I mean, we could go through these, all of these amendments here, and we could see, like, like take the Fourth Amendment, all right? The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. And no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath of affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Least Pope be breaking into people's houses all over the place. Police, okay, you got, so you, you got that, didn't you? <laughs> and just pushing their way into people's places and taking their stuff. Or stopping people on the roads, taking their money. Now, don't get nervous. Folk, listen, these are things that are come out in the air. This is it's, it's a violation of constituted authority. Now, folks are going to have to deal with that. Because if people don't deal with it and don't want to deal with it, you're going to have issues because you're going to have to learn how to stand up. That's why we need to know this. We need to know both of these things here. They belong to us. Amen. They both belong to us. They belong to us as Americans. But now check it out. I thought it was so interesting the way the Amplified put that. Rebellion against constituted authority. Isn't that something? That's the way the devil is anyway. Whatever is right, whatever is authority that's right from God, Notice, constituted authority. I, I should do this, too, because this will help us. Take that word constituted. A definition of it is to give legal or constitutional form to an institution to establish by law. Establish by law. So that means that there are laws that are there, just like there are laws in the kingdom of God. We read in this book, there are principles that are to be lived by. Amen? 
And if we go against them, then we're going against constituted authority if we go against the word of God. It's the same thing about what was set up on this land. Now, so now, all of this stuff here, these are things that the enemy is using to try to wear out the saints. Let's not forget the world right now. The saints. Because as we see things going on that come against what's right, and it doesn't look like anything's going on, there comes a challenge to the mind. Do I need to continue to stand and do what's right? Why should I? Why should I push back? And it seems like there's more push coming this way. Now, in order for God's people to stand, they have to be strong. All right? And the Bible talks to us about being strong. What does the Bible teach us that we should say in times of weakness? Okay? Take a look at Joel 3. Joel 3, verses 9 and 10. See, God tells us, first of all, all right, as always, with everything, we have to learn how to talk. That's a principle we'll never get away from. <laughs> we have to learn how to talk and say the same thing that he says and be in agreement with him. Joel 3, verses 9 and 10. 10. Proclaim you this among the Gentiles, prepare war, wake up the mighty men, let all the men of war draw near, let them come up. Now, you're not going to war if you're weak. You got to be strong. You're trained to be strong. He says, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning, pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, God, I'm just so worn out. Lord, this is not fair. I'm so tired. I'm tired. I'm tired of this. It didn't say that, did it? It said, let the weak say, I am strong. So obviously God knows that if we'll put strength in our mouths, it'll do something for strengthening the rest of our constitution, meaning us. So he said, let the weak say, I am strong. So if you feel a sense of weakness, why don't you out of your mouth just say, I am strong. And then even if you don't, it's a good confession. Okay. I am strong. I am strong. Just say it. I am strong. I am strong. Because God said to do it. Amen. Okay. Now, the Lord is the primary source of our strength. There's another scripture, Philippians 4, 13 says, I can, Paul said, I can do a few things through Christ. To, oh, oh, look at that. Help us, Jesus. He said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Somebody say, help me, Lord. <laughs> all right, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, Psalm 27, 1 through 3 is a scripture that lets us know that the Lord is the primary source of our strength. Yes, there are other sources of strength, but he is the primary source of our strength. All right, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Um, whom shall I be afraid? So now if I make a little connection there, he says, the Lord is the strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? So if I acknowledge him as being the strength of my life and I believe and I receive that, then, then that's one thing that will help me not to be afraid of what's going on around me. Check it out. If the Lord is my strength, then who do I need to be afraid of? Hello? Y'all here? All right. If he's my strength, <laughs> he's our strength, who do we need to be afraid of? All right. Because his strength is a whole lot more than just natural strength. Bigger than bombs, guns, bazookas, pistols, hand grenades, whatever. Bigger than all that stuff. So much so the psalmist said, you know what? You know, there are a thousand who fall at my side, ten thousand at my right hand, but it'll not come near me. Only with my eyes shall I behold and see the reward of the wicked. So he said, all that stuff is out there. Arrow flying by there. You know, the sword, pestilence. Not come near you. He said, surely they'll gather together, but not by me. Then he said, whosoever shall gather together against me shall fall for my sake. So he even says, there's some stuff that won't even be able to get near you. 
Hallelujah. I think that's a little bit better to me. Somebody may like the testimony of being delivered from something that happens, but I like it if it can't get near, near me. I don't even have to deal with it because he said it, don't, it won't get near you because you won't walk in fear is what the rest of that scripture says. All right. So now, what is strength? A definition of strength is that it is the force that provides ability to accomplish something. All right? If I'm strong, I can get something done. Okay? If I don't have any strength in me, I can't, I can't lift this up. Now, some people laugh, but you know that people can get to a point in life where they, they, there's some things they can't lift up because there's no strength to do it. You've had that happen? I had ha things happen over the years where I, I had, you know, I got to one time, it was like a little bit hard for me to open a bottle cap. And I thought, what? 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 This is crazy. And so you got, you got to do something about that. Yeah. And I said, really? Yeah. You see, so... If there's no strength, you can't accomplish something. If there's no strength, then you can't stand against the evil one. If there's no strength, there are forces coming at you, and if you don't have the strength, then those forces coming at you will overcome you. But if you have strength, you can not only push back, but then you can walk on whatever it is that was coming against you, which is what God wants us to do is to walk on that stuff. Not just kind of stay steady and, you know, we're in a tug of war and nobody moves. He said, push back. And then when you push back, whoever, the enemy you're pushing back on is supposed to fall down. <laughs> and then you tread on him. Like Jesus said, we're to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And then he said, nothing by any means shall hurt you. See, I like that. I want to reach for the top. I'm reaching for the top. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. Jesus said it. It is in red. Hallelujah. Okay, so now, 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, The very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we've had studies in our lives over time where we've studied spirit, we study soul, and we study body. We break it down for the purposes of getting understanding. But when we look at what the scriptures tell us, the scriptures are actually telling us that all three are supposed to work in concert. And that the sanctification process of God is for the whole man. Come on, and this is important, man. Not just spirit, not just soul, not just body. See, now, we, we, we got so messed up because of the enemy and the way that we all, grew, everybody grew up being more conscious of your body than anything else. Isn't that right? Huh, no pain for me. Uh-uh, don't hurt me. Uh, I'm scared of that. Uh, I fell off my bike. Oh, bro, me. Ah, I don't want that pain anymore. Don't touch that stove. Ah! And you go around for a while being scared of stoves. Every time you see a stove... Because <laughs> you think that stove is just going to burn you. Okay? <laughs> so now, here, what, what, what God is saying to us, and I love the scripture. He said, the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. So that means attention must be given to all three of those areas, and there must be a move of ours to, 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 to be in concert with God to be sanctified wholly, spirit and soul and body. Now, it would look to me, and this is the way I look at things, if I were to deduce it, you know, it, it would make sense that I should look at all three of those areas, see what brings strength to each one, and then see how they should be combined all in one so that I get a whole man. I'm not spiritually big-headed, floating off somewhere. I'm not so intellectually full that I can't understand spiritual things, and I'm not such a hulk, 
you know, and when I'm going to, and, uh, the, I can't count money, but oh, I'm big and strong, but you, or oh, they come by and try to take, you, oh, you, you say you give me $10, and they gave him two. But he don't know how to count the money, so he don't know, but he's strong. He can boom like that, and you're gone. But he can't count money. <laughs> Wouldn't make sense, would it? <laughs> okay, so now, the scripture speaks of the sanctification of the whole man, where spirit and soul and body, all parts intended to function as a whole. Now, I want to take this word synergy and give a couple of definitions of it. Okay, synergy. It's the interaction of elements that, when combined, provides a total effect that is greater than the sum of the individual elements, contributions, etc. It is the combined power of a group of things when they are working together that is greater than the total power achieved by each working separately. This is interesting. Okay? Now, we've had some athletes that have been superstars. We've had some basketball players, superstars. I mean superstars. Everybody still remembers Michael Jordan. All right? People certainly know about LeBron James. Right? All right, these, these are cats that were superstars. I mean, Magic Johnson, Kobe Bryant, Allen Iverson. You know, these are guys, you know, in football. Tom Brady, maybe, something like that. Aaron Rodgers. But now, one of the things that's interesting, basketball is a game where you have to have five players on the floor at the same time. Football on offense requires what? 11. Okay? Now, here we go. Tom Brady is a quarterback. But let's see him get on the field, and there's no lineman, no center, and there's 11 defensive players there against him. <laughs> he said, okay, you got to snap the ball on himself, <laughs> and then nobody to block, nobody to pass to, nobody to hand it off to. Man, he dead me. <laughs> okay, you take somebody like, like Michael Jordan. Cap's good. No problem. But you know what? He needed Scottie Pippen. Uh? Yeah. He needed Steve Kerr. He, if he was one against five, I don't care how great he is, he can't even end by the ball. <laughs> Can't even inbound the ball. So you, you give him a drift here, right? All right, everybody all right? So there have to be other pieces, other parts to work together so that there's a whole so something can be accomplished. You know, you look at one of, one of the, the great, great team, basketball teams uh, recently, the Golden State Warriors. They had enough. Watch out. Okay. <laughs> I heard that. I mean, they had a, a, and they had a lot of good pieces. But you might remember when they played in the championship against the Toronto Raptors, Kevin Durant got hurt. Clay Thompson got hurt. And after that happened, boy, it was hard. And even so, there were key pieces that weren't there. And you know what they started doing? They started double teaming Steph Curry. Cat probably the greatest pure shooter, but you know you got two, three people in your face. What you gonna do? Can't do it by yourself. So it doesn't matter how spiritually spiritual we are. That's not gonna be enough. Cause you on the inside can have something going on with the knowledge of God. You can know scriptures and all that kind of stuff. But what's gonna happen if you don't have a body to carry you around? Uh, you can be mentally strong, but you can be so mentally strong that that will outweigh the importance of the life of God that's inside of you, and you try to figure out everything with your head. Hello? All right? Now, and we can be strong, we can be fit, which we should be, but now if we ignore the word of God and we don't get any more knowledge, we're going to come up short eventually. So the key in life for us as Christian people is to get all three synchronized, working in harmony together so that we can be what? Whole. 
That's what God wants us to be, is whole. Some of y'all never thought about it like this. <laughs> this is important because God said, my purpose is to sanctify you or separate you wholly. Not just you be a spiritual giant in your spirit, but everything working together like it's supposed to be. Now, that doesn't sound easy, does it? Okay, nobody dared to answer. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a trick question. All right, let's look at a couple of things, a couple of scriptures that the Bible says about physical strength. Let's start from here and work up as we would call it. This body is so important. And I know that many times as Christian people, the church as a whole, we downplay it. But Jesus had to have a body in order to pay the price for us. If he didn't have a body, he couldn't go to the cross. And if he couldn't go to the cross, man couldn't be redeemed. If he didn't have a body, there would have been nothing for him to bear our sicknesses and our diseases. Uh-oh, look at that. So that body is important. It was important where Jesus was concerned. Without it, he could not be in the earth. If you are just a spirit, you can't be running around here on the ground here doing stuff. <laughs> you can't be. Can't be. You got to have a body to be able to function in this earth like you're supposed to. God set, set it up that way. So we, we look at 2 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 7. Here's the word of the Lord. I got 1 Chronicles, my bad. 2 Chronicles 15, 7. Be ye strong, therefore, and let not your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. So there's an encouragement here from the word to have strong hands. Hands do what? They do things. Hands get things done. They're one of the means through which we bring things to us. Our hands are our intercessors in a natural, so to speak, because if we want or need something, we take these hands and we reach out and we go get what we want. All right? If you didn't have hands and you wanted to pick up your Bible, you could go, mm, 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 come to me. Mm, mm. But uh, unless you really got something serious going on, that ain't going to work. <laughs> And you could wish all day, but somebody else is going to have to take their hands, go get it, and bring it to you. Hallelujah. 1 Timothy 4, verse 8. And this is a scripture that needs to be read properly. I remember over the years I heard it misread. And the way that it was read, it made it seem like the body was unimportant <laughs> That exercise didn't mean much. First Timothy 4a says, but bodily exercise profits a little. And it should say to us, Pro bodily exercise profits for a little while or the time that you're on the earth is really the way it is spoken of. So that means however long you're on the earth, you need to be exercising because it'll, it'll be profitable. Yeah. He says bodily exercise profits for a little while, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. So it means that the body does have promise of the life that is now here right now. That's why it becomes important for us to learn how to deal with these what are called the temple of God. See, to have a body that doesn't function like it should, I will be incapacitated. Man, I may want to go and do everything I can to help people, give them food, give them the word. But if I'm laid up in the bed because I can't move, somebody else is going to have to do it for me. I can't do it. Even though it's a desire on the inside of me, I can't do it because my body's not functioning. So I've got to have strength in this natural man. Got 
to do it. And so that means I'm going to have to give myself over to figuring out how to get that done. And I should be wanting to be in the best condition I possibly can. Possibly can. And this doesn't matter how old or how young you are. It doesn't matter how old you are because however old you are, you can always, you, if you're still breathing and living and moving, God made this body to repair itself and to build itself back up. And so if we do the right thing and we put the right stuff in it and we, do, we start moving and all that, we can bring it back that way. Now, young people, don't, don't, you, you, don't, don't you think I'm going to leave you out? Because what many young people right today don't understand is that they need to be aware of these, just as much aware of these things as anybody who's older. Because people, young people are getting older quicker than they used to. And getting sicker quicker. And so you can't take it for granted just because of your chronological age that, okay, you saw, I just do whatever, eat whatever, whatever. It's amazing. Now, I don't mean anything hard. I mean, we, this is not just to, to you guys here, but I'm talking about young people in the whole country. I, I, folk, I watch things. I play ball with young people. I've never seen so many young people so tired in my life. I, it's, it's amazing. I, I, I just, I, I'm amazed. <laughs> I mean, I play ball with some of these cats that are like, you know, a third of my age, and they can't hang. I'm thinking, dear God, what's the matter? And I remember when we were, we were that age, I mean, we'd shoot, we were running until we drop. And then take a little bit of sleep <laughs> and then get up the next day and ready to go out again. Yeah. And when we were a little younger, I mean, we would go out in the sunshine in the early in the day and didn't want to come back till dark. Don't call me. Please don't call me, mama. Please don't call me. Don't call me. I don't want to call. I don't want to come back. He said, boy, you, go, well, you better get here before that street lamp goes on. <laughs> and when that street lamp went on, boy, if you wasn't in the house, boy, you, you better be hooking it. <laughs> but nobody wanted to go home. Nobody wanted to go inside. And today there's so many young people, children, they don't want to go outside. And which is one of the reasons why a lot of them are weak, because they don't get no sunshine. We were out there running in the sun all day long, sweating. And, you know, we might stop and get a soda or something. We should have got water. But, you know, we, we just want to stay outside. We want to play ball, ride bikes, do everything outside. Please don't let me come inside. And if it was raining, we were miserable. <laughs> we want no rain. And I remember when we, were, we were so wanting to be outside when it was snow, we would take our shovels to the park and shovel snow so we could play basketball. If it was icy, we'd take the shovel and beat the ice, and we would at least carve out where the, where the, where the key is, you know, and, and where the lane is so we can play basketball. We won't let nothing stop us. It'd be blizzard. We'd get out in the middle of Bergen Street, we're playing tackle football in the snow, knocking people on the cars and stuff. But we did not want to stay inside. <laughs> don't let me. I don't want to stay inside. And so we were always active, getting something out of the air in the sunshine. <clears throat> that's important for all of us. All of us. See, God put that sun up there for us to draw strength and energy from, to get light, 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 light does something for us. It, when light goes into our eyes, it does something for our eyes. When that sun is up, and go, well, I tell you what, and you get out into it enough like you should, then it starts producing your own D3. You don't have to supplement. You just take the, take what God, 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 God gave you. I'm starting to get hot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now, then he said, bodily exercise profits for the time you're here. Somebody said, oh, God, Pastor, got to exercise? Well, according to the Bible, this is a wise thing to do. <laughs> Yeah, if you, don't, if you don't do anything but start walking. Just, I mean, just walk, walk, do walk, 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 do something. Do something. You start out, and, don't, and we don't have to start out by trying to, you know, break world records and stuff. <laughs> don't do that, that you wear yourself out and then get discouraged. Then stop and quit. Just take a little bit. If, you hadn't been, if you're somebody who hadn't been doing anything, walk to the corner, back. 
do four or five days. Walk to the corner back. Walk to the corner. Run, walk back. Run. Just, just do it and, and start building, moving forward. I can remember times where I hadn't been active for a while over the, in, in, during the years of my life, and I would want to start just get back into it. Go, and then the next day, all sore, and don't want to do nothing. <laughs> So I learned that if that ever happens, gradually, okay, I would go for times like I would do calisthenics, do sit-ups and push-ups and stuff like that. And if I didn't do it for a long time, you know what I'd do? I'd start with five. Somebody said, five? That's all you can do is five? Do five for a week. And next week, put one on it. Do six. And week by week, add one. See, then you start building your way back up. You get encouraged, and then you get the benefits at the same time. Hallelujah. Okay, so this part is important. All right? Mental strength or the strength of the soul, that area where we make our decisions. Oh, boy. The willpower needs to be strong. The willpower needs to be strong. Why? Because there's always going to be something and somebody coming at you trying to make get you to make the wrong decision. That's what Satan is all about. Get you to make the wrong decision. And if you're weak-willed, just like the, the, the scripture here says, one of the things we're supposed to do is to comfort the feeble-minded or the weak-minded. So that means if somebody's weak-minded, they need help to become strong-minded. There are many people today that can't make decisions. And so what happens? Somebody's got to make a decision for them. And if, if, if Lucifer is the one that makes decisions for us, we got problems. So anyway, check this scripture out, 2 Timothy 1.7. We know this scripture, and we use it where fear is concerned, but there's another element there. He says, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. Strong mind. A spirit of mastery, basically. Is what, there's one translation that puts it that way. Hand finger on what it was, the one it is. But it's a spirit of mastery. So a sound mind, a strong mind. Remember, the Bible says we have the mind of Christ. You think he's weak-minded? You think the anointed one has a weak mind? Ain't no way, ho, no way. So, the Bible tells us that there's to be, we, we have to have a strong mental constitution and that I can make decisions. There are a lot of people today that are afraid to make decisions. That's why knowledge becomes so important to us. Because when we have right knowledge, then we can make right decisions. But if we don't have right knowledge, See, give you an illustration, okay? If, if, if in my mind, I don't know that GMO foods are going to kill me, if in my mind, I don't know that trans fatty acids are bad for me, then I'm just going to eat them and eat them and eat them and eat them, and then something's going to happen to me, and I can't figure out what happened. Or you start eating them, and then somebody brings me knowledge, but then uh, I don't develop any strength and put up any resistance to not putting that stuff in my mouth, and I eat them, it's going to do me harm. But see, what I need to do is build up some resistance by knowledge. And if I get knowledge and I keep putting that knowledge before me, hey, dude, if you keep listening, it's just going to eat, and it's just going to clog up the cells in your body. Your cells are not going to be able to breathe. You're not going to be having any strength. You're not going to be able to think right. And eventually your nerves are going to go crazy. Your body's going to go crazy. Your weight's going to go crazy. Everything about you is going to go crazy because you've got the wrong kind of fats working in your body. Okay. Okay, 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 okay. So I, 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 I've been down that road before. I don't want to go back that route, down that road again. All right, let's, let's, let's do what we need to do to strengthen the will. Hello? Still with me? Okay. Inner strength or the spirit and the soul operating in harmony. 
This guy here is the, where a lot of us, you know, we pay attention to, a lot of us do. It's not the only area, but down on the inside, strength will begin working its way from the inside out. So now how do we work at being strong inner, on the, in the inner man? Well, first of all, spiritually speaking, the Bible tells us that when we pray in other tongues or pray in the Holy Ghost, so to speak, Remember, Jude 20 says, what does Jude 20 say? Building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. So that's what the Bible talks to us about, edifying that spirit man. In 1 Corinthians 14, verses 2 through 4, the Bible talks about praying in tongues or praying in the spirit, praying in other tongues. And what, when we do that, that what we're doing is we're talking to God and we're, all, we're speaking mysteries and we're also edifying or building ourselves up. There's strength that's starting from the inside. That man on the inside is in direct contact with the Holy Spirit, the real guy, the real girl, the real man. And so we start drawing out of our connection to the Holy Spirit when we Pray in other tongues. Now, we just say, we're talking about meeting a church service and, and, and tongues and interpretation. We're just talking about in your own time in life with God. You spend time doing that, then there's that, what those scriptures tell us is that there's this, this, this fortification that starts working on the inside. And what happens is that spirit becomes more attuned to what's going on. It's able to have more of an ascendance because, and it really should because we're to live from the inside outward. All right? That's one way. We can also feed on the word of God. All right? By deciding to obey the word, strength, that inner man starts getting strong. Remember Psalm 1, 1 through 3? Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And what did he, what did he say would happen? He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that does what? Brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. So what will happen just by deciding to obey the word and do what it says to do, Strength will be developed. I'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. I'm going to bring fruit forth. So I like, I want to bring forth fruit. And just do what the Bible said. <laughs> You're not going to wish fruit into existence. So poof, there it is. No. <laughs> Feed on that word. Do what he said. Just think about it. We think about a lot of things. Just give some time thinking about the word. Amen. Hallelujah. Joshua 1, 8 and 9 basically says the same thing. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but thou shalt meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. Then you'll make your way prosperous. Then you'll have good success. Then he says, we, man, come on, this one's, got, this one's got strength in it. Let's look. Excuse me. <clears throat> Let's go over there and read this one, please. Joshua 1, 8 and 9. I had a guy I was talking to one time. We were talking about the word. And he said, you know, I want to, I sure want to be able to, to have the scriptures and remember them. And it just seemed like I can't, I can't do that. And so I told him how I grew up in my teenage years. And I said, you know what I, I used to do when I got up in the morning? I used to like to go downstairs and get the newspaper, get the New York Post or the New York Daily News. Before I went to school, the first thing I do is open it up to the sports page. So all I want to do, I want to find out who won the baseball games or who won the basketball games, football games, who was boxing. That was what I did before I went to school. But one day I got turned on to that book. And so what I started doing is I took a book and I started writing scriptures in it. And then every day I would go over the scriptures in that book. And I told him that. I said, this is the way I did it. I said, that's the way I got this thing inside of me. So it's, you can't wish it. <laughs> You don't have to do what it takes to build it into you. So that's what I shared with him. I said, this, this is the way you did it. I said, this is what I did, guy. So Joshua 1, 8 and 9, and these are words that came from the Lord to Joshua. He said, Moses, hey, he's gone, dude. Your turn. 
Don't be grieving. Don't be looking back. I got something for you. He said, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then you shall make your way prosperous and then you shall have good success. Then he said, have I not commanded you? Oh, strength is a commandment. Be strong and courageous. It's a command from God to be strong. Oh, look at there. <laughs> oh, we. That's tight. Because he said, he didn't say be weak. Ooh, somebody say, help me, Jesus. And tell somebody, look, just tell them, say, say help me, Jesus. Because <laughs> it's like it's not an option. He said, be strong. See, this is the kind of stuff I like to bite on, man. I mean, I know it's like these absolutes can be crazy to your mind at sometimes. It's like, man, do I really want to go after that? Do I have to go after that? But he said, be strong. I think God knows what he's talking about. Amen. And he knew what Joshua was going to have to deal with. So he said, dude, you're going to have to be strong. And my command is to be strong. Don't go run and hide. Don't go put your face in a hole in the ground. He said, look at what's in front of you and deal with it. Be strong and courageous. Cur or have heart. Wow. Wow. <laughs> he said, don't be afraid, neither be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever, wow, wherever you go. He's with you. When you got that word like that and it's working in you, no need to be afraid because wherever you go, he's there in the presence of his word. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Well, that's why I ain't afraid to go out here. I'm not afraid to talk to these people. I'm not afraid to put stuff in people's hands. I'm not afraid to tell them about what's really going on in some of these areas. People got to know what's going on. They got to know what's going on about Jesus Christ. They got to know. So there needs to be that courage and strength working in us. Where does it come? Deciding to obey the word. Let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 13 through 16. Hallelujah. Happy Mother's Day. Glory to God. <laughs> First Timothy 4, <clears throat> from verse 13. Here Paul tells Timothy, he said, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in you, which was given you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Then he says, meditate upon these things. Give yourself wholly to them that your profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto the, to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, you'll not only save yourself. But also those that hear you. So he told him the same thing. Meditate on these things. All right, let's finish out here. Where, where else does strength come from? Where else can it come from? All right, Psalm 27, verses 13 and 14. Just a little bit of icing for the cake. Of course, as always, we never tap into everything the word has to say, but we get enough to get us started. Amen. Amen. Psalm 27, verses 13 through 14. Wow. The psalmist said, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Now, he's not saying, you know, we, we want to just kind of wait here because, you know, God, he moves so slow, but I'm just going to wait here. Then. Lord, hurry up, God. Hurry up, God. I'm waiting. Hurry up, God. No, but what he's talking about really is an intermingling and a fellowship with God and intertwining with him to where we're taking what he says. We're letting it revolve on the inside of us. We're taking time to be quiet, praying in the spirit, whatever it takes. We're taking time to go with this word and spending some time just being still. It's hard for people these days. Just be still. Be still. 
Read the Bible. Read some scriptures. Just be still. And not go get up and run and do something. It, it, it's a challenge. But he said, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he'll do what? He'll strengthen your heart. Strengthen you from the inside. He'll strengthen you. And he said, wait, I say, on the Lord. All right, where else does this strength come from? Well, Nehemiah 8.10 and James 1. Nehemiah 8, verse 10. James 1, 2 through 4. Nehemiah 8, 10. God bless you. Then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your Strength. He said, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, let's check that out. That's interesting. The joy of the Lord. Now, notice he's not saying your manufactured joy. He said, the joy of the Lord. That means the Lord got some joy. <laughs> he does. The joy of the Lord is your strength. That's why I, mean, I don't want to go to get off base here, but I, I at least need to stick this in here because one of the things that will cause that joy to rise up and what God gets joy from is meeting people's needs. That's why he said, eat the fat, drink the sweet, send portions to those that ain't got nothing. And don't be sorry. Take something to somebody else and give somebody else something good. That's the way God, he gets his jollies off of that. And it's also what keeps him strong because he's just giving all the time. It's what causes that, that joy as a strength to be on the inside. And, you know, people who are tight-fisted, tight wad and stingy going to have a hard time. James 1, 2 through 4 says, My brethren, count it all joy <laughs> when you fall into various temptations. How many of us do that? Well, we need to be reminded of that. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience, but let patience have a perfect work. Why? That you may be perfect and entire, lacking nothing. So joy is a strength, really. <clears throat> if we want to give a good definition of it, what joy, that joy comes from a, a knowing that you've already won. That's how God could tell us here to let patience have a perfect work because you'll be perfect and entire wanting nothing. And you're going through stuff is why he said count it all joy because you know that you're going to win. Now, if you don't know that you're going to win and you don't know that you have already won, it's going to be hard to have strength. You're, you're going to be moaning and groaning and crying. And Come on, we've all been there. Some of us are there right now on Boohoo Street. <laughs> At the corner of Sorrow Lane. <laughs> so that joy is a knowing on the inside that I've already won. That's why there's some people that you look at and they can be gone. You know that they, I mean, they, they're going through literally hell in their lives. But they're not spending a lot of time complaining to you. They're not beating you over the head. They might be honest and upright, but they... they they're not going to, you know, life is just so hard. I wish somebody would, you don't know what I'm, I'm, I just, I'm tribulating. There's something on the inside of them that regardless of what's going on, there's a knowing. I've already won. That is the strength that's being talked about. See, on the inside, which you, when you know you've already won, that's most of the battle done right there. And all you're waiting on is whatever it needs to be to show up. Somebody said, but it's taking so long. Who cares? What's that got to do with anything? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This joy leads to peace. Oh, Lord, there's a connection. Galatians 5. Two scriptures left here. Galatians 5, verse 22. 
See, we're talk, even with this, we're talking about a synergy of things, pieces, parts working together. The fruit of the Spirit are not meant to operate by themselves. One leads to the other. See, he said the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. So that joy and that strength or that knowing that you're already one, you can't help but have peace because you know it's already taken care of. But I can't see it. It doesn't matter. You still with me? Love, joy, peace. All right. Now, let's finish with this scripture here. Ephesians 6. Let's cap it off with this. Ephesians 6 from verse 10. We take all these different areas and we put them together and we get a whole. From verse 10, he says, finally, my brethren, and here it is again, it's a command, be strong, but notice it's in the Lord and in the power of his might. And then he's going to break it down to us how that's supposed to work. He says, put on a few pieces of the armor of God. Hmm, excuse me. Oh, put on your favorite pieces of the armor of God. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And he said, there's where your wrestling match is. It's not with flesh and blood. Sometimes we fight people. We just fight people. Some people like to fight people. And they may not hit them with a fist ever at all, but they'll put up some kind of resistance or say something or keep, try to keep somebody off balance. But you wrestle not with flesh and blood. These are the cats that we are fighting. And this is why we have to be strong in the Lord and put on that armor. So now he says, wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. <laughs> all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loin, loins, your loins, loins, girt about with truth. Now, I would encourage every believer to take these pieces and look at them on their own. Because it is a command to be strong in the Lord. He said, this is how you do it. So to me, once again, the way I think, if this is what he said to do, and this is what it takes, then I need to do it, figure out what it is. All right? He says, stand there for having your Lawrence good about with truth. We know the word is truth, right? Then he said, having on the breastplate of righteousness. Obviously, understanding our place as the righteousness of God is so vital, and it's the breastplate. Boy, what it covers, if we looked at it in the natural. Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. 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 God is our peace. All right? Remember he said, the God of peace sanctify you holy. Peace means to be at one. See, that's what that word means, to be at one. I believe it's Irene. It means to be at one. Peace is wholeness. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the, all the, oh God help me, all the fiery darts of the wicked. Not just a few. Every flaming missile he sends, God said that shield of faith is to quench it. That's absolute, y'all. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And then he says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So God gives us what we need to be able to be whole and strong, spirit, soul, and body. Amen. Amen.